You're listening to the RFP Success Show with eight-time author, speaker, and CEO of the RFP Success Company, Lisa Verhurek. Tune in each episode to learn what today's Capture and RFP teams are doing to increase their win percentages by up to 20, 30, and even 50%, and meet the industry trailblazers that are getting it right. Let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the RFP Success Show podcast. I am your host, Lisa Rehurek founder and CEO of the RFP Success Company. And also welcome to our 100th episode. So this has been a fun labor of love over the past couple of years. And I'm so excited that we have hit the 100th episode. So welcome to that. And I'd like to introduce you to our fabulous guest today. We're talking all about how to knock an oral presentation out of the park. So we've got two guests here to talk about this. The first one, Ted, he is a proposal manager and writer here at the RFP Success Company. Ted, welcome. I'm excited to chat with you today about this. Lisa, glad to be a part of this. Thank you. Wonderful. And then we also have Andy McGowan, Senior VP and Director of Strategic Initiative, Comcore Consulting. And Andy, I'm so excited also to have you here and kind of pairing you up with Ted to address this important conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's good to to be here. And obviously, I would love to tag team with Ted. So good to be on the show. (laughs) I love it when I have guests that know each other well and um, have worked together before. So this is going to be fun. And really the reason that I wanted to have this topic of conversation is because I feel like oral presentations always get a little bit of a, a Cinderella feel to them. Nobody pays that much attention to them until, until they need to. And all of a sudden you're rushed to figure out an oral presentation. And so many people don't take them seriously enough. And they're really really the thing that's going to take you over the top to get that win. So that's what we're here to talk about and give you guys some really great tips and strategies on how to prepare for oral presentations. So we're going to get kicked off right away with the first question. And Ted, I'm actually going to point this one to you. For our listeners really to get the all-encompassing foundation of oral presentations, like when do oral presentations come into play? Like what do they do for the company? Why, why, do, they, why do they even exist? Sure. Absolutely. Well, first of all, also congratulations on your 100th episode, Lisa. It's an honor to be a part of this. I know Andy feels the same way, uh, part of this momentous occasion. You've really become a trusted advisor in the RFP space in large part to the work you do in these podcasts. So congratulations and thanks for that hard work. Uh, But you're right. You know, if a company's made it to orals, the first thing you need to say is congratulations, right? It means that out of likely a dozen or so submissions, it it could be even more, uh, you're probably one of three that made it into the next round. So the first thing that you need to do when you are notified that you've uh, made it to the next round of orals is pat yourself a little bit on the back. Uh, congratulations. You know, it's a boost to morale. You're, it, it gives you some confirmation that your approach is on the right track. It's been confirmed. Take a moment to celebrate. I always tell my oral teams that I coach to take a moment to celebrate, but just for a moment, right? Because there's still yeah. a lot of work to do. We haven't won. We haven't brought this one home yet. So still a lot of work that we need to do to win it. So what I like to tell the coaching, uh, when, I, when I coach teams, I tell them is, look, this is a job interview, right? You, your team, and your company are interviewing for a job by the hiring managers. And the hiring managers in this case are the evaluators. So if you approach it in that perspective, I think it puts things in a little bit more of a perspective of what you need to do in order to impress the evaluators. So orals are an opportunity for a company to showcase your experience and your team's talents. It's, It's an opportunity for the evaluators to see in person by the people who will be doing the work, the benefits of working with you. So, and if it's a public facing or highly visible project, they get to see how you handle that. You know, I've worked with uh, teams that uh, have come into orals and, and we realized that this was something that the, it was clear in the RFP that the, the, the company would be taking the public response to a lot of this. So we, this is a chance for the evaluators to see that. But, you know, not every team is good at, at uh, our company is good at public facing projects. So, but they want to get a glimpse to see how you handle that. But it's a great opportunity at Orals for a company to tell your story. And, you know, you and I, Lisa, and, and, and so many at RFP Success, we're always talking about how an RFP is really the story of the company. And, and now is another opportunity for you to continue to tell that story, but in person. And I say continue 
because what you're really doing uh, as a company is you're highlighting and focusing on some key areas and answering questions that you've already provided in the RFP response. This is just doing it in person. It's your opportunity for, you, for your company to speak about your understanding of the requirements, showcase your differentiators. Uh, likely you might know who the other uh, two or three uh, companies that are also coming in. So you have a real chance to highlight and hone in on the differentiators from uh, those that are presenting as well. And, and really, most importantly, and I know you say this a lot at the RFP Success, is that you often say, never forget that there's a human being on the other side of the RFP, right? How many times have we heard that on these podcasts? Hey, you say that. <laughs> Spot on, right? So this is an opportunity for you as a company to put a human face, a human side of your response that they just can't get with the written response. No matter how good we are at writing the response, there's something about being there in person from seeing that. So finally, it's an opportunity to present well directly to the decision makers and win the contract. At the end of the day, that's what it's about. I've seen third place, uh, Lisa and Andy, I'm sure you've seen this as well. I've seen third place RFP responses win simply because they brought it over the line on a good orals presentation, right? It can be that decisive. But conversely, I've seen the incoming leader lose after a poor orals presentation as well. So you got to be ready. Wow. The last part you just said, Ted, reminded me of, I was on the evaluating committee for a previous position. And we had three agencies come in. And the last thing you said was true. The, the incumbent came in so underprepared that when we gathered afterwards, it was, oh my God, they were terrible. <laughs> How did in it like they were really good on paper? They did a really good job because they were remote. The client was in Florida, the company was in Cleveland, they had come in and their their CEO was good. Their number two guy who was a technical person was just terrible. And the CEO of our company looked at me, she goes, she was awful. I, I cannot believe that they did that and they weren't prepared. And we awarded the contract actually to another company. So your points, I, I think are right on is like, you know, you get to that point, you're that you've won, you've gotten there, pat yourself on the back. You know, everybody looks good on paper, right? And you, you do all these things and wow, you make pretty things. And like this company, they had a great, you know, deck they sent to us and we looked at it, but the, they were not ready for the oral, which is, as Ted said, it's telling a story. It's coming in there and going, you know, A, thank you for bringing us here. And we're glad that you thought of us and we have the capability. So you get to put that human element to the group and go, wow, we're going to like to work with them. And I think it's a two-way street too. And, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll probably talk about is, you know, afterwards, but you get to feel like, is this something from the person pitching? Like, do I want to work with them? I always, you know, and you kind of, you know, later things like, what's it like? You know, what, how is the room set up? What do they like to it? But it, it's that opportunity to, to sell your company, to sell your team, right? So the people that you bring to the presentation of the orals are very important. And I found that again, we had this other group that did win it. They brought like four or five people and a few people sat in the room and didn't say a word. So they were like, ah, you know, you got to do them. But who you bring is really important and who speaks and how they speak and how they present. And, and I think we'll hit that in a second. That to me is it is you know the key part. So as Ted said to reiterate, he hit all those points for me. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just ask you what what do you think was not prepared by the technical person on that proposal? Like, did they just not know the numbers? Did they not know no. the specs? I think Ted said it earlier. It's it's the people. He was no disrespect to techies because I worked in a tech company. I worked at Qualcomm. We have brilliant engineers. When I was there, he had the personality of a rock. And he just, when it was his turn to speak, he didn't present well. Uh, and as Ted said, you know, like the second and third place, people had really good presenters. It's that chance to be a person, right? And to show like the human element, as, as Ted said, of your company, of the people of like, do I want to work with these people? Mm -hmm. like, and we were all just like, I don't know if we'd want to work with him. He might be really smart, but he didn't give me that warm and fuzzy. And it wasn't just me or the CEO, like the whole panel. We had four people on the panel. We were just looking at each other throughout their presentation. And I would say he was a little bit underprepared, but he was underprepared in terms of doing a presentation. It was almost like he was not coached. He was not ready. And the orals, I think, as we're going to talk about over this time, it's different than just the piece of paper. I've got some great writers on my team, but I wouldn't put them in front of a client because they just, there's a different element to it. 
you know, how you speak, how you present yourself, you know, and, and he just wasn't it. I feel badly because we were really like, wow, we're excited to have them. And I think it was a big letdown for the committee because we expected them to knock it out of the park. They had done such a good job. And I would say he lost it for them. And that was the hard part. Like Ted said, you know, the third place group won before. Yeah, our number, the number two place group got the contract and they just had the right people. It's chemistry. It's how you energy. speak, it's like energy, all those things. And we were excited after, and, and they were last. Something about going last, right? It's like in the order, you know, I remember from high school, I was in competitive, you know, I was in marching band in high school. And we went last all the time because we were good, but you get to leave that lasting impression that they walk out the door going, if you're last, you can win it or lose it because of knocking it out of the park. And they were That's last. So true. And it was like, well, let's go back. We like the, the number two team and, and they won the bid. That's crazy. So for people listening now, they're like, oh my gosh, okay, we probably need to pay more attention to the orals. What do you think they need to do to prepare in advance? Like who's responsible, who needs to do what, and what are some key strategies they should do to prepare rather than just saying, here's a copy of the RFP and we'll see you in uh, DC in Yeah, whenever it is. (laughs) Uh, Let me take the second part first. What do you have to prepare? It's practice. And if there's anything that, that I've learned is you can't go in cold. It almost felt like this guy went into it of like, I got this and I'm the techie guy and they're going to ask me techie questions, but you need to practice. As I was preparing for this, I, there were two things that jumped in my mind. One was, if you've seen the movie, Mel Gibson, right? What women want and forget the movie part of it, but right, they were an ad agency and it was that pitch and between it was it Helen Hunt and Mel Gibson and they would go in and they won pitches and, and how they presented was great and they practiced. The second thing is there's a book, uh, I don't know if you've read, it's called The Art of the Pitch. And it is by Peter Cotter. He was in the agency. He now teaches at Virginia Commonwealth in their brand center. And when I decided to go out on my own and leave corporate and start my own PR firm six years ago, did a lot of phone calls and they gave out three books, right? One was how to run a PR agency. Two was by the founder of Rogers and Cowan, uh, which is a big PR firm. And the third book was The Art of the Pitch. I read that book cover to cover because it was all about how to prepare for a presentation. And he was an agency guy and how do you win them? So to answer the question, he goes, he was all about practice. You need to practice. You need to make sure that if you have multiple people speaking, they know their parts. They know how to hand off to each other. Is it smooth, right? Do they they go through it? And, And that's a big thing. If it's one person, okay. But the other part was we said of, I think the most important part of doing the oral and what they're responsible for is the the open and the close. If you don't catch people in the first minute or so, they're going to be like, oh God, when is this going to end? Right next, please. Or it's the close and going, let me wrap this up for you. You want to pick your best person. Doesn't matter how they do it, but they, you know, in terms of what they're handling, but who is that best person? Because you want to win or you want to, you want to be second or third. And, and that's the biggest thing for me. Spot on, Andy. Practice, practice, practice. That's what I had written down. And I think about, you know, the Patriots. We were talking football before we got on here a little bit. And, you know, I was thinking about the Patriots, you know, whether whatever you think about uh, the Patriots and and how they play football and such. The fact is, is that there's probably fewer teams that actually prepare themselves better for getting on the field. I I remember watching uh, how their coaching staff would actually practice coming on for the kickoff and coming off for the kickoff. That's what they would spend a significant amount of time down to that kind of detail. And you need to really apply that kind of detail to preparing for your orals presentation. So, you know, I always think to myself, I tell this to teams, you know, when I, when I talk to them and I coach them and they say to me, you know, we're just fine. You know, we're, we're good at presenting. That's sort of that. That's the thing that gives me the willies right away to use a, um, a uh, term in the, in the industry here, but you've spent significant time writing and rewriting your response. So why wouldn't you do the same for the orals presentation? Oh, yeah. Think about all the work we've gone through to prepare the uh, the RFP. Well, shouldn't we put the same energy into that? Teams don't always buy into this. It's interesting too, and and, and Lisa and Andy, I'm sure you've seen this, is that you know you can be uh, as prepared as you are. Or you think you're just fine, and you've done this a million times. The moment you get under that white hot spotlight of the evaluation team, everything changes. <laughs> everything changes. Oh yeah, exactly. very much. So you've got to not only prepare them for the material, but prepare them for the experience of what it's going to be like sitting under those hot, white hot spotlights in front of the evaluators. Have you also seen in both of your experience that the incumbent 
a lot of times gets a little cocky. They kind of come in, kind of make some assumptions. Yeah, you guys have seen that too. Oh yeah, like I said, the one I talked about at the beginning, the incumbent came in and the previous two companies that were were selected came in with four or five people. It was obvious that they were polished and prepared. They had gone through this, they knew it. The incumbent brought the CEO and their and their tech guy, and that was it. And they thought it was a we got this. We've been working with them for years. They love our work. And they so underwhelmed the committee. We didn't have any choice but to say like, thanks, but you're out. And, and it was hard because we liked them and they had done good work, but they just weren't prepared. And, and I think, you know, use my, you know, the sales pitch, like, so where I, I've gone to with Comcore, right. And we're based out of Washington. I work in Atlanta. You know, one of the areas that we do is presentation training. And we work with a lot of companies in different areas from media training. So my background is in media. So if you ask questions of you need to, if I put a CEO, which I have on TV or media interviews, you better prepare and you better practice. And it's the ones I remember my worked and when I was working in tech, my CEO, I got him on CNBC. He was all set. I said, okay, you're going on with the afternoon host. Have you done this before? Oh yeah, I got this. Don't worry about it. He went on, I took him to a, a, what was called a double end, right? I took him into a studio in Atlanta. They were filming out of a uh, recording at CNBC out of New Jersey. And when I put him in the room and the lights went on, he just flipped out because it was, it was basically two of us in a room, right? It was like doing this where it's a camera in front of you, white hot lights, backdrop. He's got somebody in his ear telling him what's going on. And he just melted. And I was like, oh God, he lied to me. He didn't tell me he wasn't ready for this. And he wasn't. And CNBC is not a place to blow it. But, you know, to Ted's point, you, you got to practice. You got to run through it a bunch of times. And if you don't, as Ted said, you put how much time and money into your written piece. Yeah. But if you get to the orals, that's where you sell it and you sell how great you are. Everybody looks good on paper. It's true. Lisa, to the point that Andy's making there, too, I've, I've seen the converse as well of the question that you asked, Lisa, which is I've seen teams where they say, well, well, we're going up against X company. You know, how could we ever come in there and win? And what you have to do is you've got to be able to convince the team that this is a clean slate, you know, and explain. Yep. Andy's examples are great. It's exactly the type of examples that I would give the team to say, here's what I've seen where we've come in and we weren't the incumbent, we weren't the uh, uh, the big dog in the game, but yet we were able to pull it off. And, and you've got to show your team that you have just as much of a chance and an opportunity as anybody else. Right. And look, you know, like in Andy's situation there, you know, what if the team had not put their best foot forward? You know, they would have lost an opportunity, even yeah, when it was assuming. a bowler. Yeah, assuming the incumbent's right. going to get it and, and life exactly. is good. Right. So, yeah. I, love and I think this one thing that's out there today, too, is the big agencies, no disrespect to the big agencies, are not winning at a lot of companies having come from corporate. You're finding that a lot of companies want to work with these small, nimble, medium sized kind of agencies. Like for our company, we're getting more and more RFPs because we're in that like middle market and they want somebody that is nimble, that is willing to work with them. And I can tell you again, from being a buyer in the past at big corporate, you know, the big agencies really would frustrate like somebody like Ted or me go in and pitch and you think you're getting them. And, you know, I, I would get no disrespect. I love my daughter. She's 25 working for a PR agency in New York. I would get her that wouldn't understand some of the business as opposed to you work with a smaller agency. You get the leaders that have been there. So that's That's the kind of stuff that we try to sell right nowadays is when we go in and pitch, it's. You're getting leaders that have been there, have done this. You're not going to get a young kid. It's no disrespect to my the younger generation, right? They're going to rule the world. But I want to make sure that, you know, if, if you're spending a lot of money, they sure want some senior brain power to handle it. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's a good to have a good mix, but uh, yeah. you've got to have that, especially in what whatever you're promising in the proposal. So it, it's really interesting. I love the conversation about practice because I think a lot of people don't do that. And I remember when I was in my corporate days, they would bring me in to be the objective person that they do the dry run with. They bring me in as an objective person for them to do the dry run with because I am a no holes barred direct kind of person. So I would ask A, I would ask the dumb questions, but B, I would tell them, yeah, that doesn't make sense or this person's not stepping up. So I would also say, just to piggyback on what both you are saying with the practice is to do it in front of somebody that hasn't had necessarily a lot of skin in the game that can come in and maybe see it a little objectively. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think too, uh, Lisa and Andy, it's, it's important too, to be aware of the folks who are not comfortable necessarily doing that, you know, and yeah. as an orals coach, one of the things that I always work with teams is I will find you can, you sense it, right. We've all seen it. There's somebody yeah. in there who's just not comfortable doing it. You can tell that they're already getting anxious about it. I can't tell you how many times I've stayed after work or after the, the practice session and just closed the door in their office and just work with them on their presentation skills. And, you know, when you see that they come out and they're actually able to do this and they do pretty well. Yeah, it's great. And that, that's yeah. something that's very uh, pleasing as, as a coach. However, right. let me just say the time to do that is not when you're trying to prep for the oral presentation. Like no. if you can look ahead and say, here are up and coming people or here are the people that we're going to, put in front of, or if you're the incumbent and you know that that is going to be coming up for contract, you should get that coaching far ahead in advance so that you're not trying to cram it in the last week before that orals presentation. Yeah. Ted and I both are college instructors, right? So for the last number of years, I was teaching in the MBA program here at Georgia State. And my MBA course was strategic communications. And one of the things that was pushed by the dean to his credit was presentation skills. And that was the one thing that he said, getting back feedback from the business environment of when we're sending out our MBAs and graduates was that early on when I started that they weren't, you know, really polished in presentations. I had some really smart students that were engineers. They were analytics people who could out excel you any day of the week and come up with all the numbers. But when you ask them to stand in front of a class, of 25 to 35 of their peers, give them a topic, they, like Ted said, they kind of freaked out and they weren't comfortable with it. And I'm glad that it was part of the curriculum that we made the students do it because I had a young lady send me a note a couple of weeks ago of, I had to do it for a job interview and they gave me a case study and I had to present it to them. And she wrote to me and said, thank you so much. I not only did I get the job, I got a $35,000 raise from where I was and I'm excited. It's a job I've always wanted. And you know what made me feel good, but I'm like, she was a talented young lady, but it was making them do presentations of the material and being able to, as Ted said, the first thing I teach too is tell me a story. What's this all about? And that, you know, kind of resonates. And, and again, it was practice and they used to come back going, that was the hardest thing I had to do. So glad I had to do it because now that I'm out, you know, working, I got to do it all the time. And yeah, especially those it. techies, right? The technical people, they tend, yeah. subject matter experts that are very technical, they tend to be more of those yeah. introverts, right? It's not a comfort zone for them. And working through that is important because you need them on those presentations. And that kind of leads to, yeah. you know, we've been talking around this a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about who should be handling the presentation. Like who is best mm-hmm. suited on a team generally to handle the presentation? I would tell you, first of all, like I said earlier, the intro and the close are the most important. you got to pick your best presenter, bar none, because that person is going to create the rapport with the audience, right? Uh, and it depends on who's the lead. It's your CEO, if it's your you know, head of development, whoever is that best presenter, doesn't matter. I think that's the lead. After that, it, it depends on the company and how they work. You know, who are your, like you said earlier, Lisa, You know, depending on how you want to attack it, how long the presentation is, what's the technical, if you have subject matter experts that are, that we got to have them up there, kind of like the group that failed for where us, you know, he really needed some training, get them training now, like, and don't think it's a five minute thing. And I'm, oh, I'm going to run through the presentation once or twice and he'll be great or she'll be great. It's a comfort level thing. And I think that's where you've really got to go after. And and then who does the presentation? I think it depends on the RFP or what you're pitching, right? You know, if it's, you know, tech and you're doing, you know, the technical piece or it's web or if you're doing, you know, PR or social, you know, get that person. But if they can't do it, you can't sacrifice putting the person up there that might be your expert, but is not going to fail as opposed to somebody who's going to figure it out. And because at the end of the day, I can get you training later. I want to win the RFP. I want the job. So that's my thought. Ted? Yeah. 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 You know. I think really when it comes to an RFP in, in the orals, sometimes what will happen is the, the company will 
specify or they're explicit in who can be come to the presentation or how many or who can right. present. And, and, and that's that happens sometimes. Usually you can, as Andy was talking about before, you you might see three people, four people, or I've been been uh, RFP presentations with people about 15 or 20. And that was just because <laughs> it was out of control, yeah, right? Control, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was just nuts. So but usually you're able to, unless the unless the RFP is very explicit about that, you can pretty much bring who you want uh, and who should present, but you should make sure that you're you're looking at that. Uh, yeah, and it's to remember, this is one of the first tests of how you're, the evaluator is going to look to see how you follow directions. So it's important to look at that, make sure you they know who you want to bring, you know, can anybody just handle it? I, no, I don't think anybody can. I think, I think to Andy's point is you, the best presenter is somebody that you certainly should try and get up there in front and be able to do that. Ho- ho- hopefully most of the time that's a salesperson. I have had uh, companies that have come to me and say, well, we're going to have Bob come in and because he's the best presenter and Andy was clear to, to make this is that if they he, Bob didn't have the expertise that they were looking for. Well, you know, I've heard it said you, you can't infuse 10 years of expertise, subject matter expertise into someone who's a good presenter in just a few weeks, right? Uh, the evaluators are going to tell that they're going to see through that. So uh, you really have to have somebody in there who does, who can also at least convey it to Andy's point. But I think, Lisa, I think there's really four key presenters in an oral event to, uh, an event to really tack onto what Andy had said. I think sales is critical and I think they should present about 10% of the oral presentation. Of course, the, these percentages can adjust depending on the size of your company uh, the uh, and uh, the complexity of the RFP, that sort of thing. But I think sales should really be, as Andrews just said, in the intro and the closing. I think he's absolutely spot on about that. They may also be the one who will transition between the different modules and introduce people because they're probably the sales team and the salesperson is the most familiar to the client. They've been in the face of the company now, up until now, until the oils presentation. And remember this, this is important to remember. I tell teams this all the time. It's still at orals is still a sales opportunity. We haven't won yet. We're still trying to win the deal. It's a sales opportunity. So it it makes sense that the salesperson would play a, a bigger role in that. Secondly, I think the high level executive president, if there's one present, I think they should do about 5% of that. Maybe the intro only just to show and, and convey that, you know, how seriously they take this and that the client will have access to them. I think the PM is critical uh, to this. The person who is doing the day-to-day work, maybe 50% of the presentation. This is the person who they're really getting to know, as Andy said in the very beginning of this, uh, and he's so right, is that can I work with these people? Well, the one person that the client is really going to be looking at is the PM that they have to work with every day. And then others are about 35%, usually the SMEs. The people have the deep technical knowledge. They, as we've been talking, they often require that great deal of coaching and presentation, but uh, usually we're able to get them over the line to do that. I love that. I love that for, you know, here's four types of people, depending on what they allow you to bring in, but you've got the salesperson, the executive, the project manager, hugely important, and the the SME or the SMEs, however many there are there. So Great, great conversation there. Okay, we're going to take a really quick break here. Um, And when we come back, I'm going to ask a little bit about the presentation itself, as well as what are some of the trip ups that people have uh, that might trip them up in an oral presentation. So we will be right back. Is it time for an RFP process reboot? Are you ready to take an honest and thorough look at your team's RFP process to ultimately increase win rates and revenues? The RFP Success Company's diagnostic service assesses past responses for improvement opportunities, analyzes your current RFP processes, and works with you to create a highly customized RFP response roadmap. Book a call at the RFPSuccessCompany.com forward slash call. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the show. We are talking to Ted Koval and Andy McGowan about oral presentations and how to knock it out of the park. Do not ever assume the oral presentations are a slam dunk or that they're easy. You really have to prepare. So the next question I want to ask you guys is, what about the slide deck, the presentation itself? Do you have a slide deck? Should it be short? Should it be long? How much should it mirror the proposal? So give us a scoop on how the slide deck comes into play in these oral presentations. So I'll tackle that one. I think first, using for at Comcore, one of the key things that we say about all proposals that we write on the decks, the key is, does it sing? And I always thought it was funny when, when Andy Gilman came in and he was like, we look at it, we look at it. At the end of the day, especially on the written RFP, is like when they get through it, it's like, does it sing? Does it make you go, hmm, I'm going to get them to the next round, right? And then similarly, the, we're going to talk about the slide deck. 
you know, does it sing at the end of the day, as Ted set up before, you know, the, the people that pitch it and, you know, the four people, you know, the four people they suggested, does it make them want to go? These are the people I want to work with. Right. And so that's key to answer your question. Like on the deck, I never learned. I learned this when I started teaching and I took over a graduate class, as I mentioned earlier. And the woman who was like the department chair had handed the course off to me. And I'm a marketing PR guy from, you know, and I always thought decks were just one word. And she looked at me and she, one of the classes was the difference between slides and decks. And I, and I asked her, I'm like, I never heard the difference. I've heard decks, but the difference is when you present to a big group and you put stuff up on the screen, she called those slides. Because if you're in a big room, a slide is something that's going to have graphics, not a lot of words. Can the people in the back of the room read it? And, and to your question early on, it's like, what should it look like? You want to make sure that everybody can see it, read it, understand it. Simple graphics, simple charts, right? A simple. deck is something more of, right? Because at the end of the day, if they sit in the back and squinting to the front, and, and I'll give you an example in a second, you know, they're going to be so distracted that they're not listening to you. The slide piece is the people that are presenting. The orals are about who's yeah. in the front of the room. And the slides, I think, are the, the complement to it and the directionality of where you're going. So pictures, things like that. We had to write a speech once for the um, a senior executive for a power company here in town. And she goes, I want a very simple slide deck. She gave a keynote speech, one word on each slide. We did. She gave us 10 words. We had to pick 10 pictures and find the pictures that matched her speech. And it was one word on each slide. I was like, wow, that's got to be the easiest thing. But when you're in front of the room, I think it's got to be simple, right? A deck is something maybe that goes with the RFP that you and I would be sitting around the table. It's got small print. It's got complex charts and graphs. But that's the key. In terms of the length, I think it depends on how much time you have, right? And as you practice, you're going to go, I got whatever it is, a half an hour. We're going to practice a bunch of time and you're going to figure out quickly, it's like oh, too many slides, got to combine them, right? So I think it depends on the time. But as I said, you know, deck slides, it's different. And the other thing that I learned is, does it all hang together? Again, I was lucky teaching. I, I got a semester mentorship with the uh, faculty emeritus for at Georgia State for the business school. And he goes, you got the teaching part down. You're a good presenter. You're in front of him. He goes, let me see your decks. And I'm like, well, why? So I gave them to him and he tore them apart. And, and he was wonderful. He was, was Dr. Uh, Harvey Brightman. He's a fabulous older gentleman. He's been teaching for years, but he would take my decks and he would put them in slide sorter mode. And that's all he would look at. And he would go, go through the slides. Tell me the story from slide one to two to three. How does it all hang together? Because I would put in different things. And he goes, those don't link up. Does it flow well? So he would always say to me, does it hang well? Does it hang together? And I think that comes back to the first thing we talked about practice. You get it done. Does it flow well? So that when you're finished, people go, these people know what they're doing. They yeah, presented well. So yeah. I, I really think that's, love that flow piece. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. I had to redo my whole class for the whole semester. He beat me up. But I would say <laughs> it was, it it was worth it. It was worth every minute. He's really wonderful. And he was, but it was one of those kind of aha things. I'd been teaching for years and I, you know, put my name in, got the, the fellowship with him for the semester. He took one person a semester. And that was kind of the biggest thing. He saw me teach. He's like, yeah, you got that. But we're going to really work on putting those pieces together with the students when you're there, that your material flows with what you're speaking. I think that's really important because I do think it's something that people don't really pay attention to that, right? They're so worried about what's this one piece of conversation we're having per slide right. and not thinking about how it hangs. Ted, let me ask you this, like what questions or scenarios would be helpful for our listeners to know about in oral presentations? So in other words, like what might take them off guard? Do you have any good examples or good thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, some thoughts on that is that you, the one defense that you always have in that situation is to know the requirements cold. So if you know what they're asking and you know what you're going to respond to, that's one of the things that I, I work with the team and, and focus on is that, you know, when this is all done, we're all going to know 
the requirements cold so that whoever gets asked the question, we're able to handle it. So, but you never know what they're going to ask. And, you know, uh, I think we've all been in those situations that have had yeah. some uh, wild questions, right, that we could, we could talk about. One of the things that I like to do with my teams is that in addition to knowing the requirements cold is I like to prepare them for the questions that aren't maybe clearly articulated in the RFP. So how do you do that? Well, one of the ways I like to do it is it's effective, but it's also kind of fun. I think Lisa, Andy, you've worked with me long enough that I, I like to have fun when uh, when we're working, enjoy that, enjoy that time, do the serious business too. I like to hold brainstorming sessions w- with the team. I'll bring everybody in together. Yeah. Uh, we should start throwing questions up on the wall and uh, the things that we think the evaluators might ask that maybe aren't necessarily associated with the RFP. And this is great. You let the team get really creative here. You know, I don't interrupt them. I don't stop. Them. I let they throw up some wild, crazy stuff. Let me tell you, I have been so often I've got to go back to here. Sure enough, we come out of the orals and say, oh my goodness, thank God we had that brainstorming session because they did ask us that, you know, you put everything on the table, but I think you've got to over-prepare even for the uh, outlandish questions. Some of the questions that I think over the time that I've seen typical questions that you may not necessarily be asked in the RP, but ask is, you know, how do you escalate, handle escalating issues? Be careful in answering this one. I always tell the team, they might, they want to see, you know, do you typically go over people's heads or do you try and work it out with your your peers first and that's the answer work it out with your peers i recommend always saying that you work your way through the chain of command if you do have to escalate we talk about having a peer from your company talk to a peer of their company so give them that comfort level that you're you're certainly going to hold everybody accountable and you're going to make sure that the work gets done but that there's going to be a professional process about that that all levels of the company are going to maintain relationships uh, to deal with that I've had questions, you know, where uh, uh, how do you handle change orders? You know, there's this uh, sometimes evaluators think the companies are really holding on to that opportunity to upsell, you know, during the hour when we really got them. <laughs> right. So uh, where we're going to be able to go ahead and, 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 and they have no choice, but they have to do that. And I've really not seen that in the companies that I've worked with where they're saying, well, we'll just upsell them later on. I just don't uh, see that. But there is that perception out there. And so, you know, I always coach the teams about making sure that you talk about how you're, you you know, transparent you are. Give them examples. Talk about how you you constantly, through all of your reporting and meetings such, or make the, the teams fully aware of issues, risks well ahead of time, and then provide them ideas for mitigating those. So there's that trust there that you're you're trying to help them get over this potential risk, risk that's coming. And that if you do, it comes down to a change order, walk them through the process. How do you do it? And you have a detailed process and you, you'll show that. One time we were asked, I remember I was asked a question, though, really, this is the only time I think maybe I wasn't prepared for it, is that we were asked that question, I prepared the team, uh, is to say, and I was actually on the team as well, is, uh, well, how do you handle, you know, disagreement among the team members? And, you know, we had this great response about, you know, working together and having all the issues on the table and all that. And I talked, we talked about how we would come to the project manager to work it out. And, and, and her response was, Oh my gosh, don't come to me. I don't want to have anything to do with any of those problems. And so (laughs) so it's like dead silence for a moment until we all kick back in and say, well, of course, here's the escalation process we'll follow. (laughs) So there's always one question out there. You just, you're you're going to get it that you've just weren't ready for. And the other thing I think too, is have, have somebody there that really knows the numbers of your cost proposal, right? Like, I don't know why this popped into my head, but if any of you watch Shark Tank, uh, which is All where time. entrepreneurs pitch, right? And Great. they always get thrown <laughs> off by the questions around the financials. And that yeah. seems to be one of the biggest, know your numbers, know your numbers, know your numbers. So Excellent. great information. No, true. Yeah, great yeah, information. That's very true. So, uh, so Andy, I want to ask you this, as we start to close out this podcast episode, what are two suggestions that you have for a first time oral presenter? Well, I think we hit one. We've said it enough. It's like, it's practice. It really is. And if you don't practice, you're hurting yourself. You're really not going in prepared. It, you you might not win, but I'm telling the practice piece of it, like we said, the my example at the beginning, the incumbent didn't practice, wasn't prepared and, and lost the bid. And we as the awarding team were, were, were disappointed, but, you know, it was obvious that maybe they didn't, you know, take it seriously or thought they were the incumbent. So I would tell you practice. And two, well, normally I would say C number one and go over it, but one other thing, <laughs> you know, and do it twice. But the other one, and we we kind of talked about it around in terms of the presentation, 
And again, it was interesting reading Peter Cotter's book and I pulled it out preparing again for today was don't be boring. Like you go into it and it sounds Philly, like in terms of presentations, you know, you're there, Ted said it, it's, it's to be, you, you're there to sell yourself. You're there to tell the audience and remember the audience that you're there to help them solve a problem in some way, shape or form. Remember the audience, but don't be like boring and reading your slides and kind of, you know, one of my favorites, I love Winnie the Pooh. You know, Eeyore is always that really kind of down to earth kind of guy. And we had a friend when I used to work, that was his nickname. But, you know, don't be boring. Make sure that the people, you enjoy it and that they you know, walk out of it going, I really want to work with this company. And, and that's, you know, the, the, I think the most important is like, you got to sell yourself. You might not win, but you don't want to be boring and make sure that you practice. Great tips. Great tips. Ted, same question to you. Well, you know, one of the things I said, we said this before too, is know the requirements hold. You've got to know what it is that the client is asking, expecting of you, uh, especially in the section that you're responsible for. They want to see how well you will be able to work and understand the RFP. So that's that's absolutely a critical component. But another thing I say is is kind of why we're here today is, is to convince anybody out there, and I think Andy is saying it here too, is do everything you can to get the team to participate in orals training. You're going to get a lot of resistance. You're going to get, we're just fine. We've done this before. I don't have time for it. I can tell you that I have coached and trained dozens and dozens of, of teams for orals and almost every single person that I've coached needed to coach. It. Almost. There've been a few that are those exceptions that and Andy, Andy knows seeing them. You've seen them, Lisa. But just about everybody's needed some kind of coaching going into this. So if you're a leader in a, in a business and, you know, the world's presentation uh, manager comes to you and says, look, I need your team to participate or they're not participating. I need you to help them get, get them there. Get them in front of the training. Uh, you'll be better prepared. You'll be more relaxed and you're ready to show the client that you, your company and your team are the best choices to solve their problems. Wonderful, wonderful, beautiful ending to our lovely hundredth episode podcast. And what a great topic that, you know, I, I don't see a whole lot out there on this topic. So this was really great information. I appreciate it. Ted, how can people get in touch with you if they want to connect with you or just ask you more questions? Yeah, well, I work uh, with Lisa. I'm honored to work yeah. with Lisa and the team at RFP Success. So you can get our website or uh, through Facebook, or you can reach me at Ted at RFPSuccess.com. Great. Andy, what about you? So we do a lot. And thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. The best way is Comcore Consulting is our website. So comcoreconsulting.com or my email is first initial last name. So A McGowan, M-C-G-O-W-A-N at comcoreconsulting.com. And we will be glad to help anyone do this stuff because we do presentation training for a living. I love it. I love it. Well, both of those, uh, all that contact information will be in the show notes along with the book that you mentioned. So again, thanks. I appreciate you both being here, especially for our hundredth episode. So thank you both. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. thank you very much for having us. Yeah, Absolutely. Really. All right, everybody, as always, if you like what you hear, please share, give us a rating, subscribe to the show. Um, we love having you all around and we hope to be here for another hundred episodes. So on behalf of my wonderful guests and myself, I want to thank you for listening to the RFP Success Show. This has been another episode of the RFP Success Show with Lisa Rehurik, eight-time author, speaker, and CEO of the RFP Success Company. Thank you for joining us. If you have feedback on today's episode, email us at podcast at rfpsuccess.com. No matter your business size, industry, if you have an in-house RFP team or need outside support, the RFP Success Company helps increase RFP win ratios by 10, 20, and even 50%. Learn more at the rfpsuccesscompany.com. Come